We'll get to EMDR later in the interview, but central to EMDR is the concept of memory. So how do you explain a framework of memory to patients? Yeah, look, I think I, I try honestly not to use the word memory very often. Um, <clears throat> rather, I prefer to use the word experience. When we do talk about memory though, we assume, most people assume that we're talking about autobiographical memory, that part that is on the left side of your brain in the hippocampus where language and thought and experience are all integrated into a memory. But in actual fact, with a lot of trauma, um, traumatic experience is held as a very fragmented memory. And there are other memories, if you want to call them memories, like the implicit memory um, and the working memory that are much more involved in traumatic experience. So when I talk about memory, I largely refer to the memory of the body or the implicit memory. And for those clients who are particularly curious about that or people who have traumatic experience before they even had narrative memory. You think about very young people who've had, you know, traumatic experiences from childhood um, and early childhood. Most people can't remember, you know, exactly back to three years old or two years old or one years old. But the brain um, certainly codes the experiences that we have and that's the implicit memory. And that really also carries through right through to death, the implicit memory. So even people who have lost their autobiographical memory, like people with dementia, um, will still experience memory um, and learning. It's just developed from the base stem areas of the brain. So the implicit memory. So I largely talk about experience, emotions, body sensations. And in some instances, people have space time narrative that go with that, in which case it's a more integrated memory. Um, EMDR um, is a therapy that aims for what's called adaptive information processing, and that really is just a fancy way of saying that the, um, the top order functions of the brain, the parts that are about language and learning and space and time, um, understanding can integrate with body sensation and body feeling into a cohesive experience. Um, but that's not always accessible to people when they're dealing with trauma, um, particularly developmental trauma. When trauma or experience happen in such an early phase of life where we cannot form clear memories, um, is it more difficult to work with patients who have these very early life experiences because they cannot rationalise the source of their distress? Um, yes and no. Um, Yes, in that it can be really comforting for people to understand that they are coding experience or learning experience, which is a form of memory, in their brain, depending on the brain's developmental capacity at the time. So a three-year-old brain or a four-year-old brain um, is not experiencing things in words. It is experiencing things as body sensations, as a felt sense, as images, not words. You know, you'll hear children who are anxious saying, I have a sore tummy. Um, you know, so their experience is a felt experience. And that um, is really active early in life because that part of the brain is developing quickly and importantly to give us a sense of how do we stay safe in the world. So when people have had very early chronic um, complex experiences of trauma, their brain is literally growing in an environment where they cannot be safe. And so this is deeply coded in their um, body signals, in their emotion, in their attention. And that carries through as they then further develop on in their life. And so there are some people who um, grow up always feeling a little bit unsafe or always feeling um, sensitive to relational ruptures and those sorts of things without really being able to explain it. 
but if this was the base of their foundation of themselves and the ba and the brain stem areas the amygdala the the brain stem areas the limbic system have developed with that as its base as the rest of the brain develops on top of that it, it's never going to it, it's going to link and integrate to that and so some people do not remember specific events only that they've always felt unsettled or they've always felt anxious or they're hyper triggered in experiences now and they don't understand why they just know that there's a pattern and that's enough to work with so what you're saying is that the seed experience in life may not be remembered but it gets integrated into the growth that's happening within the brain over the next few decades such as their worldviews and feelings associated with the event that they may not be able to retrieve? Yes, that's exactly right. So trauma doesn't always have to be a specific event. Often it is. Um, like a single event trauma, like you know, a, a big accident, car accident and those sorts of things. Um, but often it's growing up in a... Um, you know, in an environment where things were unpredictable, where things were volatile, possibly where there's, you know, emotional, physical or even sexual abuse. Can you please explain EMDR and what it is? So EMDR stands for eye movement, desensitization, reprocessing. Um, yeah, I know, psychology loves big words condensed into acronyms. So essentially what EMDR involves is it's recalling traumatic experience while you are bilaterally stimulated. And bilateral stimulation means you've got two sides to your brain. The, and bilateral stimulation means stimulating both sides of your brain through movement. Most of the time that's with your eyes, moving your eyes from one side to the other. But EMDR um, doesn't really need to have eye movement. Um, it, some practitioners use tapping, some people use, you know, audio tones. You think about, say, somebody who's blind, for example, they're not going to be able to necessarily follow a moving object with their eyes. So provided there's a bilateral movement in the brain, um, that really is the important part of EMDR. So that's the eye movement part. The um, desensitization reprocessing part, really this is all about having a, an, an activated experience that gets desensitized through the process because the client is in a safe place, so they're safe, they're recalling a traumatic experience which activates the body sensations and the emotions and the sensory pieces of that experience. So that's the desensitizing. And while they're in that safe place and while they're activating on all of those things, then there is a reprocessing. So what happens is the top brain gets involved as well, which then allows them to create a, a belief or an understanding of that experience that supports that person to see that experience as far less threatening so it's a combination of experience experiencing a different reality while you are in a traumatic um, activated state it's also about memory recall and consolidation which is another big word which is adding to the experience in a way that's adding new information to the experience so it's less traumatizing and it's also about discovering the triggers to the experience and the person being less sensitized to those triggers and those triggers can be all sorts of things it can be a nightmare image it can be a sound it can be a smell um, it can be a body feeling when someone starts emdr uh, will you commence bilateral stimulation sessions in the first meeting or will there be some introductory therapy sessions yeah i mean the first um emdr is often described as a complete therapy so it involves eight, eight very specific stages. And the first sort of three parts of that experience is developing the safety in the relationship with the therapist. Um, that's essential. Um, what I typically find is very broadly, um, there is the 
evolution of the therapeutic relationship. There is usually a lot of history taking and often um, with history taking, sensitive history taking because it, it, it triggers people. So telling their story will often re-traumatise them. And in an hour, we don't want somebody to come in talking about an experience, be completely undone and then have no another two weeks before they get to come in and start to work with that. So history taking for me is much more around how is the how are these traumatic experiences or this traumatic experience how is that happening in in yourself now how does that happen in the here and now and people will normally say panic attacks or nightmares or flashbacks or you know those sorts of things um, and then it's a really most of my clients like to understand what's happening in my brain why is my brain acting like this and so they do get a little bit of a nerdy neuropsychology lecture. Um, and, but it can help, I think, to understand what your brain is doing and why it's done it the way it's done it. And it is largely the brain retaining triggers of an experience to always be alert to it to prevent that experience happening again. So it's a safety mechanism. And then we talk about the process of EMDR, about you know, what a session would look like, how many you know that you will come in and there's not a lot of talking and we'll do sets of eye movement etc and then we then go in and start to do the work. Shapiro the founder of EMDR described this idea of patients needing to become time travelers rather than objective narrators of their past. Why is this distinction so important? Well as I said depending on people's traumatic experience they may not be able to narrate it um, the second thing is that the, the part of the, of the brain and where traumatic experience lives in the present, so past traumatic experience activates in the present, is usually through body sensations and emotions and also, you know, recurring, looping, um, maladaptive beliefs about the world, like it's always my fault, or I'm not safe, or I'm too much, um, those sorts of things. And so these are, um, when we do time travel, if you like, in Shapiro's metaphor, what we're essentially doing is allowing the body or the emotion to be expressed today with a very safe anchor in the relationship to the therapist in the present while we're traveling back in time to when those um, experiences started to occur. And that's non-narrative. That's I'm feeling this, I'm noticing that, and so on. Um, and the brain naturally through an EMDR process will flush to a range of experiences that are in that person's history. So it, naturally happens through the process. So EMDR involves very few words, the actual EMDR session, um, but it, it does require the client and the therapist to be in a deep collaboration because the therapist is holding the space, holding the safety and providing that safe anchor to the present. But the client is experiencing, if you like, the sensations, emotions, flashbacks um, of the past and they are noticing and observing that. So with each set of bilateral stimulation or eye movement, we always say, what are you noticing? And the client describes what they're noticing, which is in the present. It's not, well, I remember when my blah, blah, blah and this happened. It's actually, I'm noticing right now this thing. And that is the um, observation where the person can be in a safe place observing these traumatic experiences in the present moment along with all of the disturbing sensations and emotions while at the same time making sense of it. So it's really quite an amazing process. Do we know the mechanism or theory behind bilateral stimulation? Yeah, there was... Um, there's a couple of theories. Um, in the early days, it was thought that the moving the eyes was um, replicating rapid eye movement, REM sleep. 
um, which then activated the mirrored the slow um, slow wave motions of the brain in sleep. So it was um, the REM theory was that this was essentially replicating eye movement through dreaming. And we certainly know that dreaming is a really important way that the body naturally attempts to make sense of traumatic experience. It's why people with traumatic experience have nightmares or flashbacks, which are like waking dreams. Um, but having said that, um, people who are unable to do eye movement and are working with things like tapping, uh, Prince Harry um, used a, a what we call butterfly tapping, so that's a bilateral movement. Um, some people, you know, move their arms up and down. So what we have found is that they are just as effective, and that's emerged a new theory of what EMDR is, which is that the um, the working memory gets stressed. And when the working memory starts to get stressed, because you're asked to observe all your experience, experience the experience, remember the traumatic aspect of the experience, move your eyes or move your arms. That's a lot for the working memory to hold. And the working memory only has a small capacity. And the stress of the working memory starts to uh, remove um, items out of the working memory that the working memory would naturally hold to be alert to. So they go, well, where I would normally be alert to that screaming sound of brakes, say, with someone who's had a bad car accident. They go, oh, I can't hold that. Um, I've got all these other things to hold right now. And so the working memory theory is probably the one now that has more currency as to what's happening and why it works. So you're deprioritizing the memory by clouding it in an orchestra of different inputs in that moment. So the brain is kind of making the decision that the memory of a traumatic experience is not that important right now so that the tone gets diminished basically because the thing is is that bilateral stimulation is also working with the right and the left side functions of the brain so really oversimplistically because i'm no um, expert in this but the right side of the brain is predominantly associative so um, it associates a, a sensory stimuli to an emotion. So, for example, if I said, oh, there's a big black cloud, my brain would associate that it's going to rain. So the right side of the brain takes sensation and emotion and predicts certain things. The left side of the brain um, is where all of your thinking and higher order functions are. It's where language is. It's where thought is generated. It's where calm and logic and problem solving activate. So when we're in a traumatic state, that left part of the brain, the top functions of the brain are deactivated. And on the base right side of the brain, the body sensations and the emotions are preferenced. And what we do know is with bilateral stimulation, the working memory shuttles those body sensations and emotion stimuli over to the left side of the brain to link to language. And that's called adaptive information processing. And it's where we can integrate the higher order functions of the brain with the base level functions of the brain into an experience that's far more cohesive. Um, the right side of the brain doesn't have a sense of time or space. The left side of the brain allows that full experience to go, okay, well, that was what was happening back then. And those activated feelings of not being safe, or well, here I am safe, I don't have to, I, that screaming break sound doesn't have to trigger me because I'm not, you know, in that situation. So bilateral stimulation seems to have a very key part of EMDR, no matter how much, what form you do it in. What would be your positive response rates based on the patients that you have worked with? Yeah, I would have to say well over 90% of people with traumatic experience get really positive um, results from EMDR. And I've had, I think my youngest client was um, nine, a, a, non, a little boy with um, ASD who was nonverbal um, in the foster care system. Um, 
and my oldest client was 86. So it's, um, um, yeah, it, it seems to be very effective across age, across gender. Um, and it is now one of the gold standard treatments in terms of the evidence for a whole range of trauma, single events right through to complex development. Um, yes, it can. Um, it just requires, for example, eye movement's really hard on telehealth because if I were moving my hand like that, your eyes would only be like that. You're not sort of moving your eyes from there. You'd have to adapt. Um, all through COVID, though, we all had to work through Zoom, or I worked through Zoom. Um, and for a lot of my clients, you know, their trauma was ongoing. And in many of them, particularly people who were in quite violent situations and were in lockdowns, you know, they were in a real-time traumatic experience. So, yes, it can Yeah, or well, like I said, or through COVID. Um, there are some of my clients who have had, um, you know, their trauma prevents them from even going outside. So their primary presentation would be agoraphobia, but realistically their clinical issue is trauma. And so we work with, um, we work over telehealth and then we gradually expose that person to be able to leave their home.